The title of my sermon today is Sci-Fi God. You ever heard of one? Science fiction today is as big as it's ever been in movies and TVs, TV shows. And movies galore today for a polytheistic world. Uh, Dictionary.com defines poly as many or multi. In the Greek, poly meant much. Not many, but much. I know we all wonder today as we see society changing. Now we have this thing in the future that is now, but is going to be even bigger in the future called artificial intelligence. Except we have varying opinions from uh, millionaires to billionaires of how our world will be shaped by artificial intelligence. There are, or there were, many movies about this thing called artificial intelligence. Uh, many of you may have seen the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie Terminator, where machines have taken over the world. And he had somebody had to go back in time to correct that or move forward. I don't know. I don't, can't remember. It's been many years. Uh, I just remember the thing. I'll be Bach. It's the only thing I remember. But the Minority Report, some strange movie I saw many years ago on a plane about something controlling the world, machines. And of course, there was a TV show called Person of Interest that I think Jeff was explaining to me about, um, which is um, kind of pictured machines controlling humans and telling what we're going to do and what we're not going to do. Well, I want to talk about that today because so many of the sci-fi, I know Chris is a big sci-fi man sitting out there, so we've discussed many things. Uh, so many of the sci-fi creators, stars, various people have Jewish roots. And so there's this tie to scripture into some of those that people can go, ah, see? It's like our friend Mr. Spock here. He did this thing. Can you do that thing? I can barely. Okay. I see my, now can you do it with your left hand? Oh, you're showing off. Yeah. You're doing it with both hands. I can't do with uh, my left won't work. Okay. What does that mean? Ah, live long and prosper. We got a Trekkie sitting in the back, obviously there. Too much time in front of the screen, but that's all right. I like that show too with Spock, but live long and prosper. Did, but do you realize that uh, Leonard Nimoy was, or is, is he still alive? No. Okay, so he was Jewish, he raised Jewish, and this actually came, he added that to the script with his character because he remembered being a young person, eight, nine years old. And he went to service on Yom Kippur. And during Yom Kippur, it's a long day without food and water, but then the, the Jewish priest or whatever they call them, rabbis, had this certain prayer that everybody had to bow their heads and his father told him bow your head until this long prayer is over with because it was a long prayer well he was eight years old what do you think he's going to do look around and when he did he saw the rabbis holding their hand like this and saying the prayer of may the Lord bless you and keep you in Hebrew and he never forgot that 
and wondered why. He went on to explain it later. But when they asked him for the part and he wanted to say, well, let me show you this. And so now that's become an icon to various people, but it came from uh, Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. Maybe you remember Superman. There's been so many different ones. But there had Jewish roots. Matter of fact, his name was Kalel. El meaning God. And he was a Messiah type figure to Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, both Jewish. And they kind of created him as they put together a combo of Moses and Samson. But then they brought in this, uh, this Messiah type who would save the world from evil. Then we have the name Stanley Lieber, who was Jewish. Anybody know Stanley Lieber? Ah, you know by the name he changed it. Stan Lee. For you in, uh, was it DC Comics or Marvel? Oh, I forgot. That's offensive to people in the Trek, in the, in the science fiction world. But Stan Lee was the father of so many superheroes. He was a creator of sci-fi, so, so many of the characters today. And he got so many ideas from some scripture and the way he grew up. Of course, he wasn't a real practicing Jew, he said. But there was also Star Wars. Many people saw, and I don't know how many Star Wars movies there are now. I got lost in them because they started in the middle and then went backward and forward. And, and uh, remember, that was big in the 80s when they came out. Matter of fact, I think I was dating you when I took you to a movie of Revenge of, I don't know what it was, something. Uh, she obviously didn't remember. It must not have been a memorable date. I guess I had to have many more. But there was this character, uh, uh, whatever his, Luke Skywalker, Obi-Wan Kenobi, and I don't know, there's a bunch of others. I know Samuel L. Jackson looked good doing it, so, and so forth. So, I, yeah, I, I remember some of these, but uh, it's interesting when you think of those movies, because there were even articles written by Christian magazines of how that paralleled the spirit, and the spirit was good. And the force, they called it, was even of biblical proportions. And I would read some of those and go, well, I saw the movies, but where was God? There wasn't any God in there. It was like there was good and evil. So instead of being Christian, I think it was more New Age, where if you're good, you could be a god. And we're all gods. There's just good ones and bad ones, as so many of these things point out. And good and evil, and if the world was more good than evil, then we'll have peace. But I still remember there was nobody with all this fighting and intergalactic stuff, nobody mentioned God. How about we pray to God? No, not part of it. Not in the sci-fi world. And that has so taken over today. Because young people grew up watching it, and it's like, huh, you know, they're influenced by it. Different age groups were influenced by it. So I bring this message to you today because I want to ask you a couple of questions. Are you happy with your God? Think about it. It's not a rhetorical question. Are you happy with your God? Do you need a new one? Hmm? 
Do you need your God? Yes, I hear yes. Many prefer man-made gods today. We see that. I was reading an article, well, matter of fact, I read two in the last couple of weeks, and people asked, do we really need God, and do we really need the Bible? And I read this one, it had 38 people wrote back and gave their answer. 37 of them made a big case for no. Only one out of that. Which made me start thinking about this, this sermon because it's kind of, after reading all 37, they basically didn't need God and didn't really want a God. Didn't want anybody. And, and one of the superiors said, can't we solve our own problems? Which I wanted to say, how's that working for you? <laughs> when you look around the world. Paul made this incredible statement, and, and, and many of you may have passed over it, because I can say I have too, because in Philippians 4 and verse 19, Paul makes a statement to the brethren in Philippi, Philippi and also to us today. And he said, <laughs> my, my God shall supply all your needs. Do you think they believed him? Do we believe him? My God shall supply all your needs. You have to look when Paul was talking to Philippi. It, there was a polytheistic world he was talking to. It's, it, was the, it was a continuation of the Greek into the Roman world. There were many gods. So that's why he had to do My God. So I ask a question again. Except this one I want to hear from you. Why? Do you need God? Write it down. Why do you need God? Anybody? Well, I guess, guess you don't. Oh, here we go. Mr. Jackson. Say? Protection. Protection. That's a pretty good one. Salvation. Salvation. An afterlife. A means to an end. Anybody else? Yes. Love. What? Love. love. Because it said our God was love. That's a pretty good one. In the very back, I'll start with right there. Yes, ma'am? Healing. Healing. You believe our God can heal? Of course. Where? Guidance. You need it? Can't you figure this stuff out yourself? Strength. It wants to be empowered. Lisa? Truth. truth. You want truth. Maybe you can't handle the truth. <laughs> Go in the back and work my way forward. Yes, ma'am. Want peace. You feel like your God will give you peace. Barry? Uh, friend and a, a friend and a father. So you need relationships. You believe he'll give he has a relationship with you. That's what you that's the main thing to you. Yes, ma'am? Avenge my enemies. Avenge your enemies. Yes. Well, that's why I thought you got married. You got a husband to do that. <laughs> no? Yes, Bruce? Leadership. Leadership. You need to be led. That's you need somebody to rule. Somebody over you. Why tomorrow? You got another one? I thought you just had one. No. Endurance to persevere. Oh, to persevere. You need him to help you persevere. You can't do it on yourself. Mm -hmm. So she admits she's weak. <laughs> Knowledge. Do you want it or you already have it? Need more. Need more. And you'll get that from your God. 
Neil? And mercy. Mm, mercy. From his judgment. Ah, so you believe he's going to judge you. Of course. Okay. Do you have another one? Oh, I thought I saw your hand. I think you were just pointing at them. <laughs> all right, I asked you that because I wanted to hear. Because we all have different thoughts, but we all worship the same God. We all have the same God, but our lives are so different that sometimes, we, and, and every, I couldn't disagree with any answer. Nobody gave me a stupid one. I was looking for a dumb one we could all laugh at, but no, they weren't. These, these, these are real answers from real people who worship a what? A real God. You believe in it. From Mr. Jackson to Charmaine. All legitimate, very legitimate answers. I counseled a few people in the past. They're not here. And they felt they didn't need God. They once needed God, but then they came to a point where they didn't need God anymore. They didn't feel like he was there for them when they needed it. When they needed him, he wasn't there. He didn't heal when they needed him to heal them. They didn't give instruction, comfort, knowledge. He didn't give them what they needed. And yet, what did Paul say? He'll supply all your needs. I talked to these people, tried to get them to not give up on God. But the two that come to my mind right now both gave up on God. And in their own minds, they were going to create a God they could live with. I want to look at today, if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to look at Psalm 63. Psalm 63, this is a Psalm of David. And this, more than anything else, helps me to understand David, just like hearing you today give me those answers, it, it really is an insight into your psyche, your mind, and what you think. Because everybody here was honest. This is, this is how you felt. That's why I didn't do a prelude to it or anything else. I just wanted to hear what you were going to say. So let's look at David here. And Psalm 63, I'll be reading from the New King James Version, verse 1. He said, oh God, you are my God. Crystal clear on that. Early I will seek you. Means he's not laying in bed till noon. <laughs> Saying, oh, I'm just going to get up. But then he says, my soul thirsts for you. And if you've worked out lately in this sun and humidity, you know what thirst is. He said, my soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land. Very good visual David is giving here. But he was a poet. In a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. So I have looked for you in the sanctuary. Looked. To see your power and your glory. This is what he was looking for. Verse 3. Because your loving kindness is better than life. We talked about love. How important it was that he, God loves us. And Barry talking about having a, a relationship. Like a, a, a friend and a, and, a, and a father figure. My lips shall praise you. Thus I will bless you while I live. Question. Have we? Have we? I will lift up my hands in your name. Do we? Daily? Know where everything comes from? 
My soul shall be satisfied with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise you with joyful lips. Do we? Do we? Or, my oh, God, did you allow this to happen? This week, today, verse 6, when I remember you on my bed, do we, before we go to bed, do we sometimes able to just lay there before we get too sleepy or grab that book to put to sleep or if I can, my wife, she said whenever she needs to go to sleep, she listens to a sermon. A boring one. I just always have to look over and see if it's mine. <laughs> it says, when I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. There were watches during the day, there were watches at night. It's a military term. Okay, and so when you can't sleep, when you're up late, do we meditate on this entity, this power, this theos? This being. Because you have been my help, therefore in the shadow, Shaddai, in the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. Shadows, it's pretty nice. I do a little work on my mother's house. It was hot. So I worked in the morning in the shadow of the house. In the afternoon, I worked my way over. I didn't used to do that when I was younger. I was very dumb. <laughs> I need my tan. <laughs> no, I don't need a tan. <laughs> but this is the way God is. Do we want to be in his shadow? Yes. Remember the song on eagle's wings? My soul follows close behind you. And then, if you, have your, if you have your Bible and you're reading it, there's one important verse I left off. Okay. That last verse, that last verse says, Your right hand upholds me. Not, your, not his left, his right. 90% of you are right-handed, so you can understand. It's usually your strong hand. So David's even saying, you're not going to give me just your left. You're going to give me your right. You're gonna, that, that's going to uphold me. I, God, you got me. How big is the right hand of God? Big enough for you? Big enough to take care of things for you? How about Isaiah 40 and verse 12? I don't have that up here, but it says, He, God, measured heaven with span. In the Bible, there's span. That's his point to this point. Okay? Mine's eight and a half inches. That's a span. He said, God, Isaiah was his Bible, He measured the heavens with this span of his hand. How big is that? God measured heaven with a span. Universe, this universe that we know or see, scientists say is 15 billion light years in radius. That's 90,000 billion miles. I think the hand's big enough to take care of us all. Yeah, you say, but, but that's just poetry. That's just, no, God can do whatever he wants. He can make the hand small enough to wrestle Jacob. He can make it big enough that he can hold everything and use the earth as his footstool. This is our God. Not Superman. He doesn't need tights. <laughs> he doesn't need a big S because he's God. 
That's why it's important even for our young people to realize who's got your back. I always knew my father had my back. Just didn't realize somebody else had his and mine and everyone in my family. Your right hand upholds me. You want somebody else's hand? I don't. Matthew 6.33, right? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Remember that one? How about the New Living Translation? He will give you everything you need. Not what? Need. Did that pop up there? You looked at me like, what? Everything you need. And sometimes I need a lot. Most of the time I need whatever you guys said. <laughs> I need that. How about us? Remember Elijah on the mountain, Mount Carmel? He asked the people to do what? Choose Baal or him. God tells us today, choose. Your science fiction gods, your own creation, or me. And sad to, to say so many people pick something else. Why wasn't God good enough in the past? In the beginning? Remember Genesis 3? <laughs> she had it. But then Satan came along and said, wait a minute. If you do this, you're going to be like God. And what did she do? Oh! I don't think she just nibbled. I think she wanted to be like God. Oh! Ate that. And then he looked at her and he went, oh. they wanted to be like God. That's part of the problem today in this society. It's been taught and, and, and you see it in movies and you see it in books and you see it on news reports and everything else that we basically can solve our own problems. We're smart enough. And we're even smarter than God in too many places. But you see, that's not our God. Our God is who we look to. Not to these things. Uh, so, as I begin to wrap this up, I have 14 minutes and 20 seconds. So we stay on time today. I want to look at a scripture that you've read many times before, but I want to look at it from a different perspective. Because Jeremiah gives us a rich perspective, very rich perspective. So if you will, go with me to Jeremiah. Woe well, is me, Jeremiah. Remember? Jeremiah 10. Sound familiar? Jeremiah 10. I like to read. So hear the words which the Lord speaks to you, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord. So Jeremiah was delivering that this was this was not his words. God said, "This is what you say." And you have to realize these were supposed to be God's people, right? They were Judah. They were about to be taken captive. He's asking for them to repent, and he's telling them, "Well, here's why you're in trouble," just like he tells us. Chuck, you did something stupid. Now you need to, you're going to have to pay a little price for it. Because if you did that in my way, you wouldn't have the problem, would you? And I have to say, amen. Yes, God. So, he says, do not learn the way of the Gentiles. Because they wanted to learn the way of the Gentiles who had other gods. Moffat calls it what heathens. Uh, the old King James calls it pagans. Don't learn the way of the pagans. 
Do not be dismayed at the signs of the heavens. Oh, let me see what my astrology says today. I can't believe that I heard the other day driving down here somewhere, the, the, well, the astrologers say that today, really? I need to know that? For the Gentiles are dismayed at them. They were at that time, well, guess what? Has anything really changed? For the customs of the people are futile. For one cuts a tree from the forest, the works of his hands of the workmen with an axe. They decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and hammers so it is not toppled. I, I remember as I was in Tennessee for a couple of days and I walked out into the woods out by our farm and this came back to me because I was 10 or 11. My father took me out at that time a few days before Christmas and we went and cut a cedar and we drug it back home. It was only about that tall. Cut a cedar tree. It's my first experience of that. And so he was telling me that, oh, well, you're going to get their own Christmas tree. And so we brought it over, and he had this little red stand or whatever that holds it up. And we, we put screws in it and, and, and it held it up. And then we put all this silver and you know, lights and a star on the top. And, you know, I was like, wow. And he said, this is Christmas. This is Christmas. This is the biggest part of it. I said, okay, back of my mind, no it isn't. No it isn't. There's no presents under it. <laughs> That's what my thought was. <laughs> it's not a tree, Christmas tree, till there's presents under it and they got my name on it. But I so remember that. And, and this was supposed to make us all happy and this was brought joy. We didn't go to any church at that time. And just a few years later there was no Christmas tree anymore. My father God had opened up his mind. He began to to understand the real God. And he said there won't be Christmas. We're not celebrating it. Pagan. I didn't know what pagan meant. I knew it wasn't good because I wasn't getting presents. <laughs> but it wasn't until later did I understand that. And then uh, you could read it in here. It's so real, but this thing's 2,500 years old. They were doing it then. We're doing it now. So let's go. Uh, in verse 5, uh, do not be afraid of them, for they cannot do evil, nor do they do any good. Inasmuch as there is none like you, O Lord, you are great, and your name is great in might, separating it. Verse 7, who would not fear you? O king of the nations, for this is your rightful due. For among all the wise men of the nation and in all the kingdoms, there is none like you. No gods like you. But they are all together dull-hearted and, <laughs> dull and foolish. A wooden idol is a worthless doctrine or a vain teaching. Silver is beaten into plates and is brought from Tarshish where they had silver mines and they could make this, oh, beat this out and make it look all great. And gold from Euphos. The work of craftsmen in the hands uh, and of the hands of the metalsmith. Blue and purple are their colors. Oh man, they made these, these idols look good. But the Lord is the true God. He is the, what? Living God and an everlasting king. At his wrath, the earth will tremble and the nations will not be able to abide his indignation. That's 2,500 years ago. 
they were about to find out in the next couple of years what it was to lose their city, to lose their kingdom. It's going to happen again. That's what our Bible says. That's what our God says. Because, because why? Yes, idols are still there. We've got, we've, we haven't learned anything in 2,500 years. Verse 11. Thus you shall say to them, the gods that you have made, you have not made, the heavens and the earth shall perish from the earth and from under the heavens. It's going to happen. He has made the earth by his power. Uh, it didn't evolve. Okay? It didn't pop up in one big explosion. Okay? He did it. He has established the world by his wisdom and he has stretched out the heavens at his discretion. When he uttered his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heaven and he causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He brings the wind out of his treasuries. Uh, it's uh, climate change. <laughs> it's global warming. It's El Nino, Nuno, whatever. Uh, no, God control. He has this thing under control. Don't worry about it. It's going to be taken care of by him, by our God. Remember, Paul? All our needs. Supply all our needs. I love this thing. You don't realize God is all you need till God is all you have. But it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. But sometimes we have to come to that point, don't we? This Bible is a story of family. It is. It's, it has always been God's desire to have a large family. It starts with the first family. In Genesis 3. Because you see, Genesis 3, it, 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 it's not after Adam was created. It was after Eve was created. That's when the family began. That's what God wanted. And it goes in Genesis 4 all the way to Revelation 21. Revelation 21, 7 says what? I will be his God and he will be my son. Because God's going to come down and join his family in the greatest family reunion ever seen. Our God sets before us life and death. Blessings and cursings, he calls it. And we get to choose. We get to choose. The world gets to choose. Everybody gets to choose. That's why I had the guy not long ago call me. And he says, well, you know, should I really do this? I said, it's your choice. Yeah, but I really want to. I, I know I should do this, but I really want to do this. I'm torn between the two. I said, then choose. He said, well, how do I know what to choose? I said, why do I tell you what does the Bible say? We know how to choose when we read and live by every word. It's kind of this, um, this Bible study that we're having after, after we eat. We really want to do that and show you the importance. It's not some topic I threw out, but how important it is that we know his word. Because there's so few people that do today. And it's, and it's getting less and less. We are the preservers of his word, of his truth. You know, in this instance, God is pro-choice. Sci-fi God or the real God. You get 70 to 90 years in an imperfect world or eternity in a perfect world. 
It's up to you. My only words are two. Choose wisely.